War and Peace. War and Peace? Dude, more like Boar and Peace. Wait, what? Yeah, it's over 1,200 pages with almost 500 characters. Okay, yeah, I can see why you want to hit that eject button. But look, there's no two ways of putting it. War and Peace is a long book, and yeah, many people do struggle with it. Is it you? Are you not a serious enough reader for it? Or is it Tolstoy? The dude's over 100 years dead. He's clearly just not for modern readers. Well, there is a secret to this book. With War and Peace, Tolstoy began to wonder if we really understood what it meant to be a human being, and whether we really, quote, got it when explaining our actions and why we do the things that we do. So he issued a challenge to us, a challenge to historians even, for how we look at the facts. Think of it this way. When a major change occurs in our society, well, what led to that choice? When we look at slavery, when it was abolished in the U.S., Congress passed this amendment. But were they the ones that initiated that discussion? Did President Lincoln cause it? Was it the people in the states demanding equality? And when did that voice become so loud the leaders couldn't ignore it? This is Tolstoy's problem, is that a lot of history books focus on the leaders, which minimizes the humanity in history. All the people involved in the wars, in the polls, in the screaming, in the picket lines that demanded change, their voices are absent in the history books. And this is where Tolstoy's challenge is issued, of how do we look at our past and the leaders and who really caused change to the things that we do? A lot of times, we don't even have a choice. It looks like a choice, but there's really only one answer that really made sense. So did the leader really choose it? or are they being compelled by the forces around them? In War and Peace, Tolstoy takes real historic people and puts them in his book to meet his fictional characters. It creates a unique experience that exists in the twilight between reality and fantasy. And it does feel real, but Tolstoy uses this to challenge us readers, modern readers at that, to think differently about our choices, and that's what makes this novel stand above the rest. The story takes place between 1805 to 1820, but it's the events that led up to this moment that really set the stage for this novel. In the late 1700s, most countries were ruled by a monarchy, where kings and queens were born into their position and had a monopoly on power and violence. Power was handed down to prince and princesses, whether they deserved it or not, and then they made the calls for how that country should be run. Many subjects even viewed these rulers as being imbued with divine powers, a representation of God's will on earth. How could we ever question that these divine beings were wrong? Or how could we even influence them? By modern standards, life at this time was not fair, and people were stuck in the social class to which they were born, with almost no mobility. General poverty, grain famine, lack of political satisfaction— yeah, people wanted a change. Enter the French Revolution. The backdrop to this novel and the beating heart for what was challenging Russia and Europe's way of life. You see, France was the birthplace of enlightenment, and it challenged the people to more independent thought, and maybe even the question of is divine leadership in their control? Well, the French Revolution ended this, and it was an attempt to put the power back into the people's hands. Well, at least the people of France, as they removed the king and instilled the fundamental principles of liberal democracy, putting power and choice back into the people's hands. Or at least that's the historical narrative. What this novel explores is over the next several decades, Europe was rocked, with monarchies being challenged in their divine right to rule and be absolute in their decisions. We saw one of the most violent and tumultuous times in Europe's history. And meanwhile, Russia's dealing with their own form of kings, the czars. People anointed by God in their coronation to lead the Russian peoples and to tell them how to live. And yes, several liberal reforms would take two steps forward and then a couple steps back every time there was a change in leadership. But it wasn't until Catherine the Great, who is even referenced at the beginning of this novel, who led a new era into Russia with French thought, ideals, and further championing their language into the court of nobility. Meaning, yes, many Russian nobles also spoke French. 
So when war comes to Russia's doorstep, and the czars of Russia speak mostly French, well, things got a little awkward. Can we just pretend France doesn't exist, thought the czars? <laughs> I joke, but in all honesty, France was one of the largest landmasses in Europe at the time. And for the past century plus, it was the heart of enlightenment and how to think and move forward as a society. So what does that mean for Russia now? You see the characters wrestle with this, and now you'll know why. Because in 1805, the setting of this novel, change had come to the world and to Russia's door. It came with revolution, and it came with war. And it wasn't just a war of the feet, but a war of ideas. A war of the future of Europe and Russia. A war of the people was now at Russia's doorstep. So War and Peace is not a story in the traditional sense of how did one country defeat another, or how did Europe's history change forever as Tolstoy looks back on it decades later. War and Peace is an examination of our humanity being lost and won. It's a dive into historical fact and challenges historians in how we interpret history, and a challenge to the philosophy of how should we govern ourselves and live a better life. We're going to start a discussion of War and Peace, volume by volume, chapter by chapter, as we hike through this massive tome and offer to you a conversational partner. We don't want you to feel intimidated like we did. The goal is to talk through the events. Crypto historian, and this being a channel that focuses on a lot of 19th century Russian literature, there's just a balance between being a first-time reader and feeling overloaded. And our series here is meant to be entertaining, but also still gain a deeper understanding of the text. And inevitably, you're going to ask me what translation to read. Hopefully the English one if you're listening this long into the story. <laughs> in all seriousness, there's a ton of French in this novel. You're going to want to go to the store and probably pick up one or two copies and leaf through them. And yes, you could go for the flashy new Pivier and Volohansky with the active voice, or go for the traditional mods who are steadfast and perhaps maybe a little bit more socially aware with their translation. Either way, you're going to spend a lot of time with this book. A lot of time. So you should spend some time leafing through a couple different copies to find out which translation resonates with you the best. In the end, the worst thing you can do is just not start. And that's what we'd like to encourage you to do, is to join us as we move through this behemoth and really find out what is War and Peace all about.